Of course, the youth group is dismissed. They're going to study the book of Revelation tonight. And uh, the rest of the people stay here with me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. You can turn your Bible to the book of Ruth, chapter 2. Ruth, chapter 2. We'll continue our journey through the book of Ruth. We're going to look at chapter 2 tonight. It's amazing that the uh, book of Ruth is only about four chapters, and uh, there's so much in that book. And some people, when they think of Ruth, think about it as a book on love, which is a, you know, is a story that can go, but we look at in more details what's going on in the book of Ruth here. It is a profound book, great book to read, so, uh, and to learn and to grow in it. So Ruth chapter 1, let's look at verse 1. I mean, I'm sorry, Ruth chapter 2, let's look at verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go into the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was too, too light on uh, a part of the field be belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And, unto, and, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they were answer him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servants that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servants that, and the servant that was set.
Uh, let, we see this from verse 1 to verse 3. As we look at this chapter, we can see of how the Lord is using circumstances to bring two people together. Let me give you a story. How my, my wife and I met, okay? Listen, when we met together, we were not Christians. Far from that. <laughs> I, uh, she had a, uh, in her childhood, she, she went to Baptist churches. She heard the gospel. On the other hand, I was born uh, uh, into a religious uh, conservative family and was far from that. I didn't, have even, I didn't even have a Bible until I was already many years married. I, never, I heard the Bible. I believed the Bible to be the word of God, but I never possessed the Bible. But anyway, it is amazing how the Lord brought out of, out of, a, out of a bad circumstance, so to speak, her mom and dad got divorced and her mom moved to Rhode Island and uh, eventually with family things, she moved to Rhode Island, and uh, she's living in Rhode Island with mom. I moved like from another continent, <laughs> all the way to America, and through a friend of hers, we met. It's like you know, at the mo at the time, it was like oh, okay, I did. You don't think about those things, but through circumstances, now you look back in time, and I look back in time. I was looking about this message. I look back in time. It was like. It's amazing how God brings people together, no matter where you are in this world. If God's, if God's plan is for you to meet somewhere, somehow, God does that. And it's like at the time we didn't even think, we weren't even Christians, but I think that the hand of the Lord was on that thing. Because eventually she got saved, I got saved, and we, you know, in the rest, we here now serving the Lord. But it was a blessing to see these things, see the hand of God guiding us along. And we don't even, many times, don't even realize that. So we see here two hearts searching without even knowing. So letter A, we see the, wealth, the wealthy, profound landlord. We see this in verse 1. Look at verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman. And her kinsman and her and her husband's uh, I'm sorry, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So the phrase of her husband's carry with the idea of by her husband. So Boaz was at no relation to Ni uh, was, I'm sorry, Boaz was not a re was Boaz was not a relation to Naomi. He was connected with her by Elimelech. This is important. It was because Boaz connected with Elimelech that, that he could be the kinsman redeemer of Naomi. So now the Bible tells us something about Boaz. It tells us that he was a mighty man of wealth. That same expression is translated elsewhere in the book of Judges as a, as a mighty man of valor. This term is applied to, to men who were distinct or, or distinguished because of their military powers. In the Old Testament, the phrase is most used in a fighting situation. Therefore, we believe that Boaz was mo uh, most probably a warrior or a, somebody that had been in war. So the times of the judges with, with times of trouble. Now, we have to understand right here why we say this. Because the book of Ruth... It happened in the time of the judges, all right? And we already have done with the book of Judges, but it's amazing we have a love story in the book of Judges, which is a troubled time for Israel. So why was troubled time? The Bible says in Judges that people were doing right in their own eyes. They put God out of the way. They went and worshiped the gods of, of the land, of the heathens of the land and the pagans of the land. And it was a time of great trouble of Israel. In Israel. And in this time, we see the book of Ruth fitting right in. So don't you get in your Bible and think, okay, I read this book. Now this story happened, and this story happened because of the books you read. No, some of, a lot of these books are happening in the same time. So book of Ruth is in the time of the judges. Okay? And I believe, some people, some theologians believe actually that the book of Ruth, or the story of Ruth happened in the, in the same time of the judge called Gideon. So it was in that time. So don't think that this is a isolated story here. It happened during that time. It what, what tells us that in times of trouble, in times of, of or, 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 when people don't even walk with the Lord and all these things, there's always somebody that is trusting God. It's two individuals right here, actually three, because Naomi, which was backsliding, came back to the Lord. So 
Uh, so now the Bible tells us something about Boaz. Like I said, he's a great man of uh, uh, wealth here. So uh, every indication that we have in the book of Ruth shows that Boaz was a man of integrity and influence. He appears that to be an outstanding citizen in the community. I believe this is in, in the new outline. The name Boaz comes from two Hebrew words. Hen, or no, ban, I'm sorry, meaning son, and as, meaning strength. So the name Boaz literally mean, mean, means son of strength. I don't know if you have Daniel or Mia. I guess you don't. Okay. You do? You do have that? Oh, there it is. The name Boaz comes from two Hebrew words, band meaning son, and as meaning strength. So the name Boaz literally means son of strength. So let it be, we see the woman, um, actually, yeah, the woman in poverty. Do you see this in verse 2? Look what it says. And Ruth, the Moabites, said unto Naomi, let, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. So both Naomi and Ruth knew that they, were, they needed food in their homes. Listen, folks. This story is very practical. It's just like me and you every day. There are people today who have abundantly. There are people today who are in great need. And it's always going to be like that. It's always going to be those, and as long as this world is world, uh, it's always going to be those who have abundantly and those who have little or nothing. It's always going to be that way. You know what we, are, we should do about this situation? Thank God for what we have. Because, you know, some people have more than we do. Some people have less than we have. And we say, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what I have. And be thankful for what we have. But anyway, and we see two women right here in poverty. But we have to understand, this situation is very critical because they come to a point that they have to go literally look for food because they have none. And believe me, there are people like that in our world as well. So both Naomi and Ruth, like they were in the critical situation here. So Ruth take, takes initiative by suggesting that she should go to the field and glean. Now, the author shows us the poverty of Ruth in several ways. Number one here, she's called a Moabite in verse 2. Ruth was a foreign. She was an outsider. She was a stranger. She didn't have any friends in Israel besides Naomi, her mother-in-law. She had only been in Bethlehem uh, at the most a couple of days. So as a matter of fact, she's, uh, she sets out looking for someone whose eyes she can, she can find favor. So this woman is new in town. And this woman, because her mother-in-law is of age, it can be in those fields trying to work all day and beat down by the sun. She said, I'm going to work. But guess what? Everybody's looking at her. Even the servant says, when, she, when Boaz sees that woman, and they said, that's Ruth the Moabite. They actually, they single her out. That's who, she, that's who she is. Can you imagine her in the midst of all that people? So, the, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let, me see, uh, let me see where I, where I was right here. So as a matter of fact, she says, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, looking for someone whose eyes she can find favor. You know, if you go to a, a strain or a different place that you're not there or you've no, been there and you've been there for a the time, the first thing you want to make is friends, right? Get to want to talk with, make, uh, if you, the, the neighborhood you live, you want to talk to the people across the street or if, you want to talk with somebody, make, get, get to make friends with people. It's the same thing. But here you see her. Her situation is, 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 more, is very critical. She just wanted to go find food for them. And, of course, and the people, of course, are looking at her and putting her aside right there. So there are not many ways of making a living open, open to windows, but one such as was provided by the custom of gleaning. We see right here, according to Le Leviticus chapter uh, 23, verse 22, this was given by the law for people who were poor to go in the fields and glean. And those who own those lands are supposed to do that. Actually, let me, if you go there, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, I want you to see that for yourself there about this gleaning, about these fields that were left. And of course, the Lord is already making provision for that. So people that have their eye need. So look what it says in, in verse 23 of Leviticus 23. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make uh, glean radiant of the corners of the field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather 
any gleaning of the of thy harvest thou shalt leave them unto the poor unto the stranger i am the lord your god in whose root right here root was a stranger in the land Ruth was not one of the poor of the land. She was a stranger in the land. And God says right here in Leviticus 22, many, many years before this happened, it says, you know what? You leave those things for the poor and the strangers. See, it was, it was, it was laid down in the law that the harvest time a man must not reap his land to the very borders. He shall, uh, uh, nor shall he pick up what was left after the reapers went, went through. As a matter of fact, he, uh, if he forgot to, sh uh, to, uh, to sheaf uh, uh, and left in the f fields, it was forbidden to go back and get it. So whatever was left in there, supposed to be left in there, because it was forbidden by law. Actually, Leviticus 24, 19 says, And if a man caused a blemish in his neighbor, and he had done, so shall it be done to him. You see, in such ways as as those certain provisions was made for the poor, they could go through the fields. Let me tell you this. We say, well, those people, t did God takes care of people? Yes, he does. God makes provision for everyone. He does. He does make provision. We see that here and lay the law, the way God make provision for those who were destitute even of food so they could get something. And let me tell you, and we should do the same. Even Jesus, when he walked in the earth, he made, he made sure he fed the multitudes. You know why? Because they were hungry. And we should do the same. So let it be, we see the woman receiving instruction. The woman receiving instruction. We see this in verse 8 and verse 9 of our text. You see, it says right there, And then said Boaz unto the, and the root, Harvest thou not, my daughter? Go now to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the, the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of, of that which the young men have drawn. So usually owners of the field would not interact with those poor people that were glean in the field. But let me tell you, something happened here. There was something that Boaz observed in Ruth that caused him to approach her and treat her differently than the other gleaners. Listen, this happens to every young man or every man that put eyes on a lady that has interest or, or, or some, something clicks in their mind and said, Wow, I'm attracted to that person. And they begin to treat that person differently. And we see Boaz here doing the same thing. He's, he's the owner of the field. He has many people working for him. Now we, he, he asks about the, the, the young lady. They tell him who she is. And guess what? He begins to treat her differently. Any other situation, he wouldn't even budge and it would just do the things that he had to do. But not in this case right here. Could it be that, that he just felt bad for her for being so young and being a widow? Could it be that he felt so bad for her financial needs? Could it be that he was just a nice guy trying to do nice things? Could it be love at first sight? From the passage, we see the special, the special kindness of Boaz by the way he treats Ruth, by the way he instructs her. So number one here, a new outline, instruction to be steadfast. Then verse 8, and he said, and then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Is a question mark right there. Go not to glean into another one's field. Go, go, uh, go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. So actually, he asks the, her a question, then he actually tells her or, or encourages her to stay there in, her, in his field. Ruth is commanded to glean in the field. She is invited to, to glean in the field. Why? Something is going on there in the heart of this man. Ruth doesn't know it, but Boaz has plans to take care of her. If she will abide in the field, she will enjoy the best he had to offer. Note this. The same is true for the child of God. If we abide faithful, faithfully in his field or in a field, in God's field, he will bless us beyond beyond our wildest, wildest dreams. The reason so many miss out the blessings of God in their lives 
is because they don't glean in the fields of the Lord. They glean in the fields of the world. You follow that? That includes Christians. God says, you follow me. You come to me. I will bless you beyond measure. And, and we go to look at him and say, I heard you, Lord. But we go to the fields of the world and we glean there. On the why, we miss God's blessings. It happens to so many Christians. They're missing God's best because they don't listen to God. Let me tell you. Did Ruth reap blessings from staying there? Yes, she did. The next day, she went back to the same field. She listened what, what he said, and she listened. She obeyed and went. You know what? And she reaped blessings. So much blessings she reaped when she went home. Even her mother-in-law say, was surprised by the amount of, of food that she brought home. Let me tell you something. The more we glean in the fields of the Lord, the more blessings we reap. You say, well, is that true? Well, you got to try the Lord. Because God says in his word, he has blessing, blessing beyond measure for, uh, for us. We just have to believe that. We cannot glean here and there and expect God to bless us. God is looking for faithful stewards, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. He's looking for faithful stewards. He is looking for those who come to glean in his fields. Number two, instructions concerning root safety. Look at this in verse 9. Let not thy eyes be on the field that they do reap and go thou uh, after them, have I not charged the, uh, charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? So the, this man that worked for him, God's specific instruction, you do not touch that young lady. And, and when thou art athirst, go into the vessel and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So Boaz had commanded the men to leave her alone. Is that blessings? Yes. Because those people look down on the poorest of the poor. They were in the corners of the fields reaping, but the reapers were looked down on those people because they knew they were destitute. Isn't that the way our world does today? All right, you walk, you walk in New York City, and there's a homeless person sitting on the, on the, uh, on the side of the street. And what most people do, they go like this, five, five feet, ten feet away from that person because he, he's contagious. Our world does that all the time. I've seen it with my own eyes. I'm not saying that everybody does, but a lot of people do. They even ignore them. Oh, he's just, you know, he's just a drunk, he's just a drug addict. We just prejudge people. Sometimes we don't understand why the person is in the first place. We have to interact with them and talk to them to understand what, what's going on there. Listen, I've been with the, I dealt with many people that, that were, especially in the Providence, Re, Providence Rescue Mission, many times there. And let me tell you, not every person that is homeless is homeless because of alcohol and drugs. There's people there that lost their jobs. There's people there that lost their homes. There's people there that, that, that were thrown out of the house, young, young men and young women, by their own parents and have nowhere to go. And they find that, find that place is that or the streets. And let me tell you, sometimes we prejudge people. We think, like, what happens today, the same thing. In those days, the, the, they will look down at the cleaners because they're too poor. And they, you know, so they said right here, do not touch her. And folks, let me tell you, how many times we see those homeless people and we ignore them. And we walk five, ten feet away. We don't want nothing because they're contagious. Our world is as much guilty as those guys right here. And Boaz says, you do not do that to her. Boaz is making sure that no one t takes unfair advantage of Ruth. Is he, telling, uh, he is telling her not to worry. He's not to, he, uh, he is taking care of the details, of every detail for her. She can't trust him to look after him. And let me tell you, what a lesson for the church today, isn't it? We can trust our Lord to take care of us. He is more concerned over our welfare than we are. God is concerned about me and you. God is concerned about our well-being. God is concerned about where we go and what we do and our safety. Of course he is. We have to trust the Lord because that's what he wants for us. Don't he tells me and you do not go glean on the fields of the world. Glean in my fields. And many of his children know what they're doing. They're gleaning in the fields of the world. Number three, we see instructions concerning root supply. We see this in verse 9. Boaz makes sure, makes sure she knows that he has everything she needs to be satisfied. She didn't even have to work to get, any, to get any of it. 
Let me tell you, so it is with the, chi- so it is with the child of the Lord. He has all we need to be satisfied as we walk through his, this world. You know, you might not be not have riches like, you know, wealth and, and money in the bank and this they yacht, this mansion and this things. But let me tell you, our God will give us enough that we can be satisfied. When we learn to be satisfied in the Lord, we will see His blessings keep on coming and we look at life more differently. Listen, the Apostle Paul when he said, I learned to abase, I learned to, to abound, in everything I learned to be what? Satisfied. Where was he? In prison. It's like, how can somebody in that position even say such a that? You know what? He learned to rely on God. When we learn to rely on God, and learn God, when God gives to us, let me tell you, we, in, 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 no matter what situation we are in life, we are satisfied. May we learn that. Jesus has all that we need. Jesus is the rest for the weary. According to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Psalm 23. Jesus is the refreshment for the, refreshment for the thirsty. Jesus is food for the hungry. John 6, verse 30, 35. Jesus is healing for the injured. Uh, Psalm 23, verse 5. Jesus is hope for the discouraged. Psalm 23, verse 5 and 6. Jesus is shelter for the frightened. Psalm 23, verse 4. He is all you need. Are you discouraged this Christmas? Maybe you didn't have a good Christmas. Maybe you didn't have the presents that you wanted or the goodies that you wanted. Maybe you're disappointed. Let me tell you, in God, in Jesus we, ne- we, never, we, we are never disappointed. He always gives what we need. But let me tell you, we need to be satisfied in Him. Let us see. We see Jehovah, the Lord of providence. We see this in verse 3. Look what it says. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hep, uh, hep was, was too light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was, who was the kindred of of Elimelech. So the Bible says that Ruth began the process of gleaning and she and she happened on and, and she happened to come to the field of Boaz. So that phrase makes it clear that Ruth did not understand the full significance of what God was doing. She didn't know the people, she didn't know the owner of the land. She came to the field apparently by chance to grab food. She probably walk and look at the field. Oh, it looks good in here. Walk right in. She had one thing, one need. She needed food. It happens to all of us. You know what, what happens? Happens is this. We look, we're looking for something and sometimes we don't understand the Lord is guiding us along the way. God is guiding His children along. And many times we don't see the hand of the Lord guiding us. Sometimes, you know, we can tell the Lord is guiding us and we hold it. We don't want God to guide us. We want to take control of our lives. And when we do that, we make a big mistake. Solomon says, one even happened to, uh, happened to them all. That phrase points to the truth that man do not control events, but the hand of the Lord is behind them. And as, the, as he works, his purpose out. Let me tell you, I say this again. God is the one who's making history, not mankind. God is making his own history. And let me tell you, we will say, well, what about our world? Our world is going towards what God said is going to happen. Prophecy is happening right before our very eyes. And let me tell you, we might, the coming of the Lord might be closer than we think. That phrase points out to the true event that men did not control circumstances. God is. These two people, Ruth and Boaz, they are minded, they're doing their own things. He's the owner of the land. She's looking for food and God is moving them together and they, are, they don't even realize. I think probably he, 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 got, he, got a, he was attracted to her before she was attracted to him. But anyway, it was the fact that she came to the field and, and, and no other that was, was led to her, to her marriage to Boaz right here. It was the fact that she came to the field that no other that ultimately resulted of the birth of David uh, from whom uh, uh, Christ came. Do you understand how God's providence in his all this? We never know. 
God's providence in all this, she, she, and David came out of them. It's amazing how this happened. God is working behind the scenes. So number one, what we see here, we see the character uh, in the search. The characters in the search. Number two, we see the characters' personalities. Let's look at the characters' personalities right here. As we look at this passage, we really can see the personalities and, uh, the, and, uh, and qualities of, of each character. Letter A, we see the character of Ruth. We see this in verse 6 and verse 7. Characters define as strength of, or moral fiber. A.W. A. Tozer described character as the, excellent of moral, as the excellence of moral beings. Persons of character are noted by their honesty, ethics, and charity. Descriptions such as a man or principal and woman of integrity are assertions of character. So a lack of character is more, def, more deficient, deficiency and persons lacking character tend to behave dishonestly, un 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 unethically, and un uncharitably. So a, person, a person's character in the sum of his or his or her disposition to, uh, to intentions, desires, and actions. So yeah, let me tell you this. We live in a world today that's not, we live in a world today that we, we, it's hard to find people of character and honesty. Wonder why everything you have to do, we have to sign your name and papers. And sometimes you have to put the stamps in there. You know why? Because nobody trusts anybody anymore. There was a day, I remember when I was a kid, and a person would shake a hand with another person. That was sealed. People shake hands these days, and it means nothing. You see, character is influenced and developed by our choices. For an example, Daniel re resolved not to defile himself in Babylon, and that godly choice was an, was an important step in formulating the, uh, the integrity of this young man, which was away from home. Uh, another example, uh, several people in the Bible describe of having noble character, Ruth, uh, uh, Hannah in Nehemiah chapter, uh, Ruth, I'm sorry, Nehemiah, David as well, and Job, people of character. So, we can develop character by controlling our thoughts, according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, practicing Christian vir virtues, 2 Peter uh, 1, 5 to 6, and guarding our hearts, Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs 4, 23, Matthew 15, 18 to 20, to 20 and keeping good company, of course, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, men and women of character will set good example for others to follow. And their godly reputation will be evident to all. So number one, we see Ruth was a polite woman. Ruth was a polite woman. We see this from ver verse 6 and verse 7. Boaz had asked her servants, who was this damsel? And the servants replied that Ruth was the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the land of Moab. And then the servants relate to us a little bit of the character of Ruth right here. He says that Ruth asked him to let her, her glean and, uh, and get uh, uh, among the sheaves in the field. Now, we have an interesting thought here. Ruth was asking permission to do something. She already had a right to do so. In Leviticus, God said to what? That the poor and the strangers would glean in the fields. And Ruth goes to Boaz and asks him for permission to glean in his field. She was doing something. She didn't have, she didn't have to ask him. She could have just gone in the field and do it like the other ones. But she's so polite and kind and goes ask something that she didn't have to. It shows the qualities of this woman right here. She is a polite woman. And amazing in what she, what she does here. here. In a, uh, see, even though, even though Ruth had, had a right to go in the field, like I said, and ask permission, Ruth was a woman of vividly concerned about being polite. And let me tell you, we live in a world today then many people don't even try to be polite. They actually, actually they, they like to be rude and unkind. You meet people like that? Oh, goodness. I, I, I meet them people all the time. They don't try. They don't strive to be polite and kind. They strive to be rude. I don't know why. Actually, go to Proverbs chapter 31, verse 26. I want to see something about a polite woman. 
Look where, where it comes out of a polite heart. I think we can uh, emphasize this to men as well. But look at uh, Proverbs 31, 26. And it says, she opened her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of what? Kindness. When we, poli- we are polite, guess what comes out of our lips? Kind words. When we are rude, guess what comes out of our lips? Rudeness. Mean, unkind words. So in a marriage, there are certain things that a wife may feel she has a right to do. A godly woman, however, is not a woman that demands her rights. In, taking about a, in talking about a virtuous woman, Solomon says, in her tongue is the law of kindness. And let me tell you, a lot of times we, 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 we melt when we see somebody like that with the law of kindness in their, in their lips. There is a law that goes beyond our personal bill of rights, and that is the law of kindness. A marriage is bound to go smoother when a woman covenants with her tongue that she will not be a woman who demands her rights. Rather, she has a covenant that she will operate under the law of kindness. And let me tell you, hard to find people like that. Ruth, one of the qualities was kindness. Go to Proverbs 27, 15. Look what it says there. I'm not going to pick on the ladies tonight, but these verses, uh, because we're talking about Ruth right here, it says, look at verse 6, it says, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. So a nagging woman and a dripping faucet or, 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 or water dripping from a gutter is, is, is just like a... a, a, a uh, um, I'm sorry, a nagging woman and a dripping faucet are just like a like. It just nags, nags, nags. In nagging, there's no kindness. I guess we can apply this to men as well. So, verse 20, uh, uh, go to Proverbs 21 9. There's another one right there. And this, these are some verses that the, the Lord put there for a reason, of course. It says, It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. So courtship will run much smoother when the woman of God operates with, well, polite lips. And let me tell you, I believe something attracts Boaz right here because she goes in there and she kindly asks him for permission to glean in the field, which she didn't have to. She showed her qualities of the law of kindness. And, of course, a man is attracted by that. Let me tell you, how many women you see, they're so pretty, so kind, and you look like, you see, like, that's a beautiful woman in there. And as soon as they open their lips, you look at it and go, oh, you're so ugly. This spirit, the tone of their voice, their attitude is like it, it betrays what the person is in the outside. Boaz was attracted by the kindness of this woman. A law of kindness. Number two, Ruth was a hardworking woman. During the gleaning season, they would uh, erect little shelters for people to sit in. It was necessary for that people will find some escape there. But let me tell you one thing about this, this woman right here. She is there all day. And let me tell you, I don't know about you if you ever work in, in the farms. I did when I was a kid. But let me tell you, when the sun beats on you all day, by the end of the day, you are exhausted, literally. And the next day, you get up. And I mean, let me tell you, these people on the farms, they don't work from 8 to 5, especially if you have animals stuck in the farms. You don't work from 8 to 5. You work from sun up to sun down. And in the summer days, they are long, long days. And you know what? At the end of the day, you go to bed, and you, you are exhausted. And guess what? Sun comes up, and guess what happens? You are up too, again. And this woman was there working hard. And Boaz took notice of that. Verse 2, verse 11, look what it says, And Boaz ends and said unto her, he, uh, It had fully been showed me all that that has done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the, in the land of thy nativity, and in the uh, and art come unto, unto a, a people which, uh, do, uh, I'm sorry, which thou knowest not henceforth. She had been a, she had been a tremendous asset, of course. And right here, Boaz literally describes everything about this woman, what she did. 
She left her people. She left her country she, to, for to take care of an elderly woman. She went work in the fields to, to be able to so the, her mother-in-law would survive as well. And let me tell you, she, you could see the qualities of a hard-working woman. Let me put it this way. Most women in this country of America are hard-working ladies. I say all of all women in this country. I say most, most women in this country. Let me give you an example. God told men to be the providers for the home. We don't want to hear that anymore. Oh, we can't live out of one paycheck anymore. I hear, I hear that all the time. You know why? We're not willing to make sacrifices. That's the first thing. That's the first thing that I put. We're not willing to make sacrifices because if we're willing to make sacrifices, you know what? We don't size everything. We make sure that everything works. The problem is people are not willing. That's the first thing. But anyway, for the Christian family, God told the man to be the provider for the home. The woman is to be the homemaker. Oh, no. I mean, a homemaker is a second-class citizen. Oh, no, it's not. But let me tell you. For five and a half years, I, was, I took care of the home because my wife used to work second shift. I worked first shift at home. I wash clothes. I take care of the bed. I did all the things that my mother does. And let me tell you this. It's hard work. Believe me, I, I wouldn't be talking this way if I, if I was not there. I did it for five and a half years. And let me tell you, I appreciate everything my wife does. Because a lot of hard work. Come home, wash clothes. If you fix supper. You wash the kids. You put the kids to bed. Then you, you clean the house. You dust the furniture. Put the clothes away. And by the end of the night, you're exhausted. And you go to work next day. Let me put it this way. Okay. So, a wife... Goes to a day job, gets up in the morning, goes to the day job, works all day, comes home, and know what she does? She does the work of a housewife. And where's the husband? He's relaxing in the sofa. I say to that husband, shame on you. You know why? Because your wife already did something that you're supposed to be doing. She went out and helped you provide for the home. When you come home, go help your wife. Oh, I don't do those things. No, I learn how to do it. And let me tell you, Ruth right here is a hard-working woman. And Boaz takes note of that. What about single moms? Single moms, they act mom and dad every day. Is that hard for them? Yes, it is hard. And my heart goes for them. But we see right here, from, he's amazed, he's touched by this woman. He's, she's a hard-working woman. Number three, see, Ruth was a thankful woman. See this in verse 10 and verse 13. The Bible says in verse 10 that Ruth fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground. She was thankful for all that Boaz was doing for her. You see, Boaz right here had interest on Ruth. And he was treating her, she, he was treating her differently. On the other hand, uh, uh, Ruth right here was thankful for all the things that, she, that he's doing for her and, and Naomi to a point that she acknowledged him by bowing herself to the ground. Look what it says in verse 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed himself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou showest thou, uh, take a knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Why she said that? Maybe because the people of the land were looking down at her because she was a Moabite woman. But she acknowledged that. She was thankful. Not only, she, not, not only her, her lips, it was the word of, the, uh, the world of kindness, but she also was a, a hardworking woman. But thirdly, she was a woman that expressed thankfulness. I'll tell you what, what qualities in a woman? I'll tell you guys. What else do we want in a woman like that? That's a woman you say, yes, I want you for my wife. Kindness, hardworking, thankfulness. Wow. Number four, Ruth was, a, Ruth was a humble woman. Look at verse 10. She was, able, she was willing to bow herself to the ground. Ruth had no, no uh, uh, grand, uh, great ideas for about her future. She was looking. She was a widow. She was a foreigner. She was poor. She needed food, and that she was doing there, and she was kind. She was, she was kind to the people, to the strangers that was taking care of her. She was, she was hardworking, but also she, she was um, a humble woman. It's, it takes, listen, it takes humbleness for us to get on our knees, isn't it? 
Believe me, it does. For us to get on our knees before God and pray, it takes a humble heart. For a person to admit that that person is a sinner and needs a Savior, it takes humbleness. To admit I am wrong, I'm doing wrong, and I have to say I'm sorry, Lord, please forgive me, it takes humbleness. Don't you know, for an example, me and my wife, okay, I'll use my example here. Me and my wife, we have a disagreement, right? Okay. Let's say she's right, I'm wrong. But I'm wrong anyway in my own ways. It takes humbleness of heart in my part to go uh, and say, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? It does. Because pride gets in the way. I'm not going to say I'm sorry. No, you know what? God says, I'm, say, I'm sorry. And we do say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You know what? She was a humble woman. Let it be, we see the character of Boaz. See this verse 4 and verse 12. Boaz was a religious man. Look what it says in verse 4. And Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. You see, we see from the lips of this man, the first thing he looks to the reapers and he says, The Lord be with you. We can tell this is a religious man, a man that is walking with God. So our first encounter with Boaz takes place in verse 4. And we notice immediately that Boaz seems to have been one of those men, those men who believe that his religious faith should enter his daily work. When we approach his work, as he said, the Lord be with you. Let me put it this way. I don't know what you do in your own private life. I don't know what you do before you get to work. But let me ask you this question. Before you enter your place of work, do you pray? Oh, I don't have time for that. I have to run to beat the clock. No, let me tell you this. Do you pray? Do you pray that the Lord would protect you throughout the day? Do you pray that the Lord keep you from making mistakes? Do you pray that the Lord will make you a blessing to others? Do you pray for the people that you are around with? If it's Christians, that the Lord will help them. If it's non-Christians, that you be a light to them. This man comes and he, he his words are words of Godly words, which reveals the condition of his heart. He's walking with the Lord, and he tells others about this, this Lord. Let me tell you this. We should start our day with God. We should, before we start our work, pray that the Lord will give us the strength, and also that the Lord will make us a testimony to those we work with. You see, he says right here, this was a God-centered work environment with, where Ruth went. This phrase, the Lord blessed thee, does not appear to be uh, attested elsewhere. It was not a, commend, uh, a common greeting. This shows that Boaz had a, an uncommon relationship with God. As a matter of fact, we notice in verse 12 that Boaz in concludes uh, with a little prayer for Ruth. Look in verse 12 of chapter 2. And the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, on the, look what it says, on the whose wings thou art come to trust. You see the heart of this man? This man loves God. And he boldly just proclaims his name. He prayed for their first date. You will also notice then in verse 12 that he recognized the religious life of Ruth when he said, and who's, uh, and know that you have come to trust in, in the God of Israel as well. A vital relationship with God was something that was important to Boaz. And as a husband, it ought to be important to you as well. I tell you this. God called a man to be a spiritual leader in his family. It should never be the husband tell the man to go to church. Tell the men to read the Bible, to the men to lead in prayer. It should be the husband who leads the family in those things. Man is called to be the spiritual leader of the home. Let me put it this way. God doesn't call the man to be the dictator of the home because that is wrong. God calls men to be the loving leader of the home. And if we are the loving leaders of the home, we have to lead our home by example. Got to be an example. Well, let me put it this, those of you who are married, what kind of example are you setting on your family, in your home? 
See, Boaz and Ruth started the right way. Ruth was a man that was a relig very religious. He loved the Lord. He, was, he, uh, he talked about God. He, he boldly spoke about God. Even to her, he mentioned that. But we know that uh, Ruth is a young believer. Guess what? He has a spirit, she has a spiritual leader there to lead her. So, number two, number, never give you number one. Number one, we see Boaz was a religious man. Number two, you see Boaz was a, an attentive man. Verse five, uh, but the Bible says, Then said Boaz unto his servants that, that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? So Boaz recognized this woman. He said, Whose damsel is this? His attention was immediately attracted to Ruth. His main concern was not the fields anymore. It was this young woman. Let me tell you this, folks. Let me give you something right here. Some of you are married long. Some of you are married uh, early. But anyway, some of you are not even married. But let me put it this way. When you put your eyes on that girl, when you put your eyes on the woman that you married with, keep your eyes there. And make sure you keep make attention or, 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 or give her attention. And make sure that she knows that you are looking at her. That's what Boaz did. I think that's a good thing for us to do as men. Number three, you see, Boaz was a giving man. Look at verse 8 and verse 9. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. You see, in verse 8, Boaz says that he wants Ruth to, to, to hear something and 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 and. And word here, the word here here over carries the idea of understanding. So Boaz wants Ruth to understand something. He did not want her to go anywhere else but his field. He wants to take care of her. Let me tell you, folks. You always want your wife to want to be where you are on your field. Because she knows that you will take care of her. We can apply this to our own very lives today. I want my wife to always feel like she wants to be in my field. Because she knows I'm always going to take care of her. And Boaz right here making sure of that said, you don't go nowhere else. You come here because I'll take care of you. I tell you what, what a way to fall in love, isn't it? Goodness. Let me tell you, number four, Boaz was a provider. You see this from verse 14 to verse 16. Now the longer Boaz took to Ruth, the more he loved, he loved, uh, in love he becomes. And so the Bible says that Boaz invited Ruth for a meal. Now the custom for, was for the reapers to pick a quantity of the best ears and not to, not to ripe. They were, they were plugged with, this, with the uh, stalks attached and then they were tied into uh, small parcels. A fire was kindred. And, uh, and dry grass and thorn bushes and, and corn hands and they, they held the, in the fire till the chaff was most, uh, mostly burned off. So the grain of them sufficiently roasted to be eaten and it was a favorite food all over that country. But let me tell you, but Boaz right here shows that he is a provider. You see how Boaz, because he loves Ruth, has a desire to provide for her. I tell you what, that should be the desire of every husband. I don't just love you when I date you. I love you for the rest of my days. And for the rest of my days, by God's will and by God's power, I will take care of you. I tell you what. Goodness, I've been married for a long time. And praise the Lord, I will continue until the Lord take us home. But let me tell you, I saw my grandmother and my grandfather in his, in a late years when they were old and gray and we were already I was already 17 18 years old and I could see the love when they were sitting together old people old couple already my my grandfather still oh you always work you always did something but he would come home and my grandmother was always you could see the smile when he, she would see him coming and 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 I, I have to be honest with you it, it, that love was just there you could see it 
the joy and the gratitude of being together. And that's what, that's what is like, you know, the love that, that you see when you see the woman for the first time and continues for a lifelong. Let me tell you, we guys, we need to make sure that we are providers for our home. Not just provide the physical food and the means of living, which we have to, but provide love and kindness and, and provide all these things to make our wives feel comfortable and feel like they don't want to glean nowhere else but there where we are. And let me tell you, Boaz started the right way. One of the things that I admire in Boaz, it was his boldness about God. I believe Boaz was a man, even though we don't see him in the Bible, probably more than likely led his family in prayer, read the scriptures to his, to his wife and to his children, and we can see the results of the, the line that came out of this couple, a godly, a godly line that came down the road, that Jesus came from this, this line. I tell you what, I put it, I, and I finish with this. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't. My family were religious. They're still religious. My dad got saved. Praise the Lord for that. But I didn't grow up in a Christian home. But my wife got saved, and I got saved. And let me tell you, I have just my heart desires for my children to continue serving the Lord, for my grandchildren serving the Lord, my great grandchildren to serve the Lord, and my great great grandchildren to keep serving the Lord down the line. You know why? Because nothing better to do in this world but to serve God and to live for Him. To make a difference in a world that needs the love of God. So husbands, love requires actions and always manifests itself in providing. Do you desire to have a marriage that is a blessing? Be a Boaz. Be a Boaz. And to the ladies, I would say, be a Ruth. And God will bless you immensely.